Are you looking for a fun way to win up to 25 times your money this football and basketball season? Test your skills on Prize Picks, the most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections for a wide variety of stats, and place your entry. It's as easy as that. If you have the skills, you can turn $10 into $250 with just a few taps. Easy gameplay, quick withdrawals, and injury insurance on your picks are what makes Prize Picks the number one daily fantasy sports app. Ready to test your skills? Join the Prize Picks community of more than 7 million players who have already signed up. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit up to $100. Just visit prizepicks.com slash bluewire and use code bluewire. That's code bluewire at prizepicks.com slash bluewire for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Today's episode is brought to you by cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to Cars.com. It's magical. Welcome in, everybody. This is the Mavs Moneyball Podcast. This is Ryan Mainville. I'm a staff writer with the site. And today, I'm joined by my good friend, Derek Murray. Today, we're going to talk some drafts. We're going to talk maybe some guys that the Mavericks are looking at, some team needs, and where they can go from here. So, Derek Derek works for the Oklahoma City Thunder. He works in their season ticket office. But you probably know him from his work over at Babcock Hoops. Derek was recently promoted to director of scouting. So congratulations on that, Derek. Uh, why don't you tell everyone a little bit about what you do? For sure. Yeah, Ryan, I appreciate you having me on. And um, yeah, you know, it was a great step that Matt promoted me to a director of scouting. When I actually started with him last year, I was a video scout and then managed the video scouting for a bit. And now I direct all the scouting and have a handful of guys who kind of help me with that as well. So uh, it's, it's a great time. You know, I get to work with and learn from some of the best basketball minds out there covering NCAA basketball, international basketball, anything we need um, regarding the draft. So this is probably the most overanalyzed class, arguably, in the history of the NBA draft. And, you know, it's no one's fault. It's just the nature of the times. Um, But it's actually really helped us a lot because we've been able to interview a bunch of players. I've been able to talk to, interview a lot of guys, um, planning a couple workouts to go to as well. So we're really excited that we finally have a lottery order finally uh, to work with here. So, yeah. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, it's definitely a, a crazy draft class for sure. Um, a lot of guys, a lot of swing prospects, but, you know, I know you've been busy watching film, I'm sure, but is there a favorite team that you've watched throughout the playoffs so far? So, obviously, I've watched watched all my Thunder games here, but I've really enjoyed watching the Celtics. I mean, Tatum is really coming into his own. Tatum, Brown, you know, I know a lot of people don't like Marcus Smart, but a guy who's willing to get in there, do the dirty work, and lay his body on the line every play, like I appreciate what he brings to the team. Uh, Robert Williams actually performed really well yesterday, which he needed kind of a coming out show, in my opinion. He, he kind of needed that to get himself some confidence moving forward. I've enjoyed watching the Celtics, and I don't know. I think, I think cleaning the glass gave – maybe cleaning the glass gave them today – like a 30 something percent chance of winning the title, which actually moves them into number one from a data perspective in, in predicting who's going to win. So I think they look really good and they've, they've been actually a pleasure to watch. Yeah, I know. I'm probably not alone with Mavericks fans and saying that we could use a guy like Marcus Smart, who's a dog and who <laughs> wants to fight. Uh, so we'll, we'll jump a little bit right into that. Did you watch a lot of the Mavericks this season? I watched some games hit or miss, obviously just working all, you know, all Thunder game nights and staying up with what we're doing on the road and um, always tried to stay up with NBA basketball at least a little bit because when I wasn't working those games, I was traveling to NCAA games. So I was on the road a lot. Um, But the Mavericks, you know, obviously had an incredible season where they said best offensive rating. Was it of all time, I think? I mean, just the way 
the way Luca drives that offense is incredible. And the way they were able to get Porzingis in that deal with New York, um, you know, I think they have the tools in place. I think they're one star away or a couple really, really strong pieces away for being a legitimate title contender. It will not shock me if in the near future they are there. I think Mavericks fans have a lot to look forward to, a lot to be grateful for. Um, and and it has, it's a fun team to watch because even though they have some star power, they are scrappy. I mean, I'm, again, like smart. They're not the same player, but I love J.J. Barea. I love watching him play basketball. So even just a guy like that on the roster, um, I've, it made me sick to my stomach. I was watching the game live when Powell went down because Powell and Kleba are really fun to watch together as well in the front court. So uh, I think the Mavs have done a great job with their roster, building their rotations, and, and what they got moving forward. I mean, the foundation is there. They, they've got Luka Doncic. They've got Kristaps Porzingis, but everything else out of that is, is kind of a question mark right now. And I mean, obviously a first round matchup against the Clippers wasn't ideal. I think mm-hmm. they probably would have fared better against maybe the Nuggets or the Jazz. But even then, they stretched it to six games, even with Porzingis playing on a torn meniscus for five out of six games. Right, Luka which Doncic, is wild because he played right. pretty well too. And that, you know, a lot of people, I'm not saying he has a reputation, I guess, of being soft, but people like to throw that around. And then you see that he's playing on a torn meniscus and put up those numbers, and I think that put that to bed. If it didn't, it should have for most people. Oh, yeah, he got called soft pretty frequently in our comments. Uh, I remember him going down, and there were already Porzingis for Embiid trade ideas going. <laughs> so that, that was definitely something. But obviously, they're not there yet. What do you think they need to upgrade whether that be a position group or a certain player in the starting lineup, where do you think they need to find an upgrade this off season? I think if you're going to go through free agency or trading, you know, you need to try to go get a piece that can give them a three headed monster on offense, give them at least some kind of effect of a big three. What will affect that the most, I believe is Tim Hardaway's contract because it is a player option for 19 million. And with him, opting in that puts them at 108 million guaranteed so we don't know what the cap is going to be yet um you know a lot of it's going to be affected by what we find out this offseason after the bubble with you know all that the nba has gone through this season so his money whether it's in a sign and trade or him just straight opting to go somewhere else is going to play a huge piece in that if they choose to address their needs in the draft um i think you can do that because at 18 and 31 they're both pretty unique spots so 18, you're not going to run some huge rookie scale contract, but because of this class and its depth, you might be able to get a back end lottery talent at 18. Because in my opinion, I think that 10 to 20 group to an extent could simply be interchangeable. So depending on how a couple things fall at the back end of the lottery, you, you know, the Mavericks might end up with a lottery talent at 18, but you're not paying them lottery money. And at 31, I always think it's one of the most valuable picks in any draft because now you're not looking at guaranteed contract money. You can structure that how you want. You can come to an agreement with the player, with the agent, um, and, and kind of see you know, what's best for both the player and the organization. That 31st pick is just really, really sweet. So I think, you, I think the play would be to use both. There's very few guys that I would be comfortable trading those to move up for. So if I'm the Mavericks, I would address it in the draft uh, at both 18 and 31 using them both. Yeah, you bring up an interesting point because during the middle of the Clippers series, there was a Sports Illustrated report that said that the Mavericks were shopping their 18th overall pick, which I mean, obviously, they're trying to get themselves into contention. They're trying to see how many assets they can get to get themselves to the next level. And so I aggregated this piece. I talked a little bit about maybe what they could do, what they could trade the pick for. And at the end, I included a poll and I asked, should the Mavericks keep their 18th overall pick or use it in a trade package? And only 41% of people said they, that they should keep the pick. Why do you think that is? Why do you think people are holding this draft pick to such like a negative connotation that maybe it's not as worth it? Because a lot of what the media tells people is that it's a weak draft. So and in, in that aspect, I don't blame the fans or the voters. I mean, I actually just went to the piece to look. Yeah, 907 votes, 41% said keep the pick and draft. Um, and then, yeah, everybody else said to move it. 
I understand because media tells you it's weak and to an extent it is, but for me, it's weak in the lack of superstar talent at the top. It's not weak in depth. I think, you know, there's probably only two guys in this class that have legitimate superstar potential and that's LaMelo Ball and Anthony Edwards. And after that, you're looking at role players and, you know, sure starters and pieces of your core, but not stars. So when you look at pick 18, it doesn't feel high to an average fan who hears, okay, with not that high of a pick and it's a weak draft. I understand the thought process of let's move it and see what we can get. So I, I understand it. Yeah. I definitely think that that's something that gets shouted out a lot is that this is a weak draft where like in all honesty, this is a dream come true for the Mavericks in this draft because like you said, this range is just golden for role players. And I brought this up in our Slack the other day where I like kind of compared it to the 2018 draft. And like one guy I saw there was Dante DiVincenzo. And if they can score a guy like that at 18, because I think he was picked at 17, but he didn't have a good rookie year. But if they can get a guy who's blossoming by year two, that's going to be really, really good news for them. Right. And that's where teams have to have honest discussions with each other or with, you know, within themselves of are we trying to get a guy who wins right now or are we okay to try to win two to five years from now? So if you're the Lakers, if you're the Lakers and the Raptors and you're at the back end of the first, you're not necessarily looking at that in the same way the Mavericks are at 18 and 31. And the Mavericks, I don't think that they're going to be NBA title contenders next season if they use these draft picks. If you want to package them both and try to go get another star, Yes, then I think you be you can become an instant contender. But if you use these picks, you're trying to win the 2022, the 2023, the 2024 NBA titles. And that's the depth and the kind of player that I think you can get at both of these picks. So I just look at it as more long-term, even though my quote long-term option here is like three to four years, uh, instead of, hey, let's package it real quick and try to win right now. Hmm, that's an interesting point. I guess like, my question would be, what do you think has to happen in those two years for the Mavericks to become a contender? Because, like, if they're not going to be at next season, I'm guessing you're saying that because of the cap? The cap, along with just how strong some of the other teams in the West are. Yeah. Like, it doesn't make a lot of sense for some teams to completely use all of their resources and go compete when you have the teams at the top who are – if you want to go by the numbers likely going to finish in the top two or three of the conference and contend. You know, that doesn't mean that's not in any way me saying that the Mavericks are not or will not be good enough. But if it's, hey, you see the Clippers there, you see the Lakers there, do I want to expend all my resources right now to try to go compete with that? Or do I want to wait in two or three years when they have big free agency decisions and then I've got Luca Porzingis, the guy I took at 18, 31, some of my young bigs, and then really go try to make a push at that point. And that, when I look at this roster, is how I would handle it. Yeah. Wow. I hadn't really considered it that way, but, I mean, you bring up a really good point about, like, the strength of the West because, man, the Warriors are going to be back next year. They're going to be strong. Who knows what the Pelicans could do. There's, there's a lot of talent, and I think that, yeah, maybe slowing down and picking up some assets is, is a good way to go. And that's what it's the same thing that I think for the Pelicans and Grizzlies. Obviously, they're not nearly to the point where the Mavericks are right now. But Pelicans and Grizzlies, hey, you're good. You're knocking on the door of the playoffs and your potential playoff team. But I don't know if I would trade your picks, move your young guys, and try to go compete with the Lakers and Clippers, you know, right now. Give it a little bit of time. You know, you still have a unit on the floor that sells tickets. It keeps the buildings full keeps your TV contracts, the money's still coming in, you're selling the jerseys. And that's really a sweet spot to be. So that that's, I would say the same thing for those two teams as well. All right, well now we're gonna hop right into my Mavericks big board. So I haven't uh, said this anywhere, but these are the guys that I want the Mavericks to draft the most. Now I am looking at pick number 18. Pick 31 is a little hard for me to analyze just with the range and how many mm -hmm. prospects there are. Mm -hmm. um, but so the first guy on my Mavericks big board, which I am going to probably catch some heat for, but I'm okay with it. 
At number 18, I think the Dallas Mavericks should take Desmond Bain. Now, Bain is a guy who I have seen projected in the like late second round for months now. And then our good buddy Richard Stamen, a.k.a. Mavs Draft, yeah. he kept doing his thing. He, he is the leader of the Bain bandwagon, and I have seen Bain shoot up mock drafts on Twitter since then. I mean, just give me a little bit of your thoughts on Bain, and I'll tell you why I think he's a good fit with the Mavs. So Bain, I think, can be a fantastic player, um, great basketball player. He's a great kid as well. Um, you know, I think he's the kind of guy you want to bring in your organization. He's versatile in offense, one of the best shooters in this class, unquestioned. He's so strong. He's built like a bodybuilder. And that is where some of my concerns come in. You know, I got to see him again being in the Big, big 12. I got to see him multiple times a year the last couple seasons. There were times where his – he was stiff and to survive on NBA floor for a long time, you've got to be a really fluid athlete, no matter how big you are. So he would get caught on pick and rolls on screens. Often it wasn't able to bend around or, you know, avoid them the way that I would have liked him to. And even defensively he has, I think he's like right at a plus zero wingspan. I think he's six, four with a six, four wingspan. Yeah. So if you're a negative, and I've seen it reported as a negative, I think, 0.1, or I'm sorry, yeah. negative one or 0.5 before as well. Yeah. So those are things defensively that I really worry about. Generally makes good rotations, good feel for the game, good IQ as a, as a defender. What I appreciate about him as well is that although he carried the load offensively for TCU, he did not check out on defense. Nothing bothers me more than when an offensive driver just straight up checks out. And I think that's just me personally being hard on people because – it happens at every level for every team, every star. You know, I, I don't want to, like, hold that against somebody. But I, I appreciate that Bain on defense, even though he was shooting and driving the offense, was still active and locked in on the other side. So I think he's good enough to handle some pick-and-roll responsibilities, although I don't think that will be his role at all at the NBA level. So um, he'll have to improve with quickness and ball handling for sure. But the shooting is there. He's a lights-out shooter. My personal opinion – I think 18 is a little bit high. At 31, I absolutely take him. Um, and a lot of that is not anything to do with the skill, but it's to do with the age. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to hold too much guys' ages against each other because he has shown improvement year to year at TCU. And age becomes a factor when you don't think a kid can improve anymore. So I like Bain. I think 18 is a little high for him. Um, but if he's there at 31, I think that would be a great choice for the Mavs. Yeah, I mean, realistically, I would probably put the chances of the Mavs taking him at 18 at like 5%, 5 or less. But I just love, love Bain so much. I love his game a lot. And a lot of that is because I think that he would be a really good counterpart to Luka Doncic. Because I think like when Luka's on the floor, Bain can just go off ball, do catch and shoot, shoot off of screens. I mean, I personally think he's the best shooter in the draft just because of versatility, because he can do it off the bounce. He can do it in catch and shoot. He can do it in all these different scenarios. Um, but even when Luka Doncic is off the court, I think that he can run a little bit of the offense. I think that the Mavericks will still probably default all of those responsibilities to Jalen Brunson to run that offense when Luka's off the court. But I, I think it's there for Bain. And you talked about his age a little bit. And that actually plays into why I like him so much as a Mavericks prospect. Because you brought up the argument that, you know, mm -hmm. maybe the Mavericks should wait a couple of years and that works out for them. I'm, I'm kind of viewing it as... You get a prime a, Desmond Bain for your run. Right. Yeah, right. That's absolutely. And, and, and that's where it fits, for sure. Like, I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, and like, I'm a little little bit of a pessimist a little bit of just I worry about things and I get nervous and I see this I think he's 22 I don't think he's 21 anymore I think he just turned 22 um, and he has four years of big 12 experience under his belt he is mature there aren't a lot of swing factors to his game like he needs to improve his finishing especially if the Mavericks are going to like be willing to take him at 18 I think that's what's going to talk him out of it Right, because um, he's going to have to be able to perform off ball in all capabilities. Mm -hmm. I mean, because in, in all likelihood, if you take him at 18, you're going to take him ahead of guys like, you're going to take him ahead of 
Achua, you might take him ahead of Sadiq Bay. You're looking at taking him ahead of Cassius Stanley. You're looking at taking him ahead of Hughes, McDaniels. I personally think that I think there's a chance that Maxi is there at 18. Hmm. And yeah, like you're saying, he's going to have to be like a team's going to be very, very confident of him, him scoring at all levels to take him as an older guy uh, ahead of all a lot of those younger like freshmen and sophomores. But again, like you make just a fantastic point where Bain makes sense because you're getting a prime, mature, like reliable, high feel, high IQ, good teammate player for a potential title run in Bain. And that's just, it fits like a glove. Yeah, and I think like the Mavericks are going to have to, like I'm imagining that this is the big question for the front office this season is what is our window? Do we see ourselves winning a championship in two years, five years? seven years. Um, and I think that that will affect their draft decision a lot because here you've got a guy like Bain, who I think that could play on an NBA for tomorrow. Like he's just that experienced. He's, he's that good. He's that pluggable. Mm-hmm. And then you've also, I think you could see minutes for sure. Yeah. And then you have guys like Sadiq Bay, who I think still need, like they need that rookie season of figuring themselves out, figuring out their role and just developing a little bit. And so this 18th pick, who we see the Mavericks draft is going to tell us a lot about their timeline inadvertently. For sure. Cause if you take a guy like Bain, um, obviously I think that tells me our windows in the next two to five. If you take a guy, another guy that could be there at 18 who makes a little bit of sense is RJ Hampton. Mm-hmm. Cause I think he can be a combo guard and play off ball off of Luca a little bit, but also handle the ball a little if Luca wants to go off, but he's a project. You know, Hampton's a project, and that's where that would almost be, you know, a minor admit- admittance of we're kind of kicking the title run down the road a little bit. So the second guy on my big board is a lot less safe than Desmond Bain, and that is Aaron Nesmith from Vanderbilt. This guy is a ridiculous shooter. He was a ridiculous shooter last season. He averaged 23 points per game, almost five rebounds per game, one and a half steals. He shot 51.2% from the field and 52.2% from three. That is just ridiculous. But the big thing about Nesmith is that he had a stress fracture in his foot and he only played the first 14 games. Derek, where is Nesmith on your big board? Right now on our Babcock Hoops mock, we actually have him 12 to the Kings. Okay. Um, I don't see him getting to 18. Mm-hmm based on the conversations we've had with people. But I think if he does, it does become a really interesting conversation of Bain versus Neesmith. Because again, they give you similar skills offensively, lights out shooters. Neesmith is a little little bigger, like taller, um, longer wingspan. But again, he's not some great versatile defender. He gets tagged with the three and D label a lot, which I don't like because there are holes in his defense as far as his footwork hips, uh, his mobility and stuff like that, but he's two and a half years younger than Bain. And that is why I think a lot of teams hold him higher in their boards and mock drafts. Again, based on what we've been hearing from teams, that for me is kind of, that's why I think he's up there higher, just two and a half years younger. Would you rather have Bain today or Neesmith if you can work with him, you know, two seasons down the road? Uh, That's kind of the conversation. If he's there at 18, absolutely, he makes sense as well because I think he gives you that wing shooter Again, excellent spot-up shooter, uh, spot-up 95th percentile, off-screen 97th percentile, catch-and-shoot 100th. I mean, Neesmith's ridiculous. Again, you don't want to put a whole – I mean, you do th- – those numbers hold weight, but you don't want to look at 52% three and think that that's right. sustainable. And again, I'm not saying at all that you are. Some people see that number and say, oh, he's a 50% three-point shooter. It's like, no, we're literally never going to see that <laughs> over the course of a season. But – yeah, one of the best shooters in the class. And if he's there at 18, makes total sense for the Mavs. Do you think that the stress fact- fracture should talk teams out of him? Or do you think that it's not that big of a deal? I haven't really, like, covered guys with an injury. But, I mean, I know you do this a lot and you've done this for a long time. Do you think that this is something that could hurt his career? I think if he had had a second one on the same foot, at that point, it becomes a legitimate real, he probably falls a little bit issue similar to a guy like Killian Tilly, who's one of the most skilled big men in the country. But his injury history is so vast that I think it's going to have a lot of teams um, 
you know, pass on him. You see a guy like Michael Porter Jr. now just balling out, and he fell to – I don't remember what number he went, but he fell out of the lottery into the mid-first because of an injury. But it wasn't a repetitive thing, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think you look at a guy like him – and you see the success he's already had so quickly is why I don't think teams will necessarily shy away from Neesmith. I think if you shy away from him, it's because of the versatility. Like his shot versatility is awesome, yeah. but his overall role on offense and defense, you're not getting a whole lot of things. Like you're getting a excellent spot up catch and shoot shooter who can, who can stretch the floor. But that is somewhat what he's limited to. So I think if he falls, it's not necessarily because of the the injury. It's because of the role that a team would see him playing. Yeah, that's a good point. I know we talked a little bit pre-pod about the Mavericks' needs and how they should probably be looking for a 3 and D guy, especially if Hardaway Jr. opts out, even though I don't personally see him doing that because of the cap situation. Yeah, and that's a lot of money. I think it's 18.9 is what he gets. I don't don't see where he doesn't come back. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous unless he somehow gets another contract on the table for more than that. But I'm all for the wings. Uh, Nesmith is a great shooter. Like you said, there's defensive question marks. Uh, That would just kind of be the Mavericks buying even more into this all defense, not great, or all offense, not great defense philosophy, um, which hurt them pretty badly in the first round. But we'll see what they do. All right, when we come back, We're going to finish up my big board. I've got about three more prospects to cover, but we're going to take a short break real quick. All right, welcome back. Derek and I are running through my Mavericks big board. We're covering some prospects. We just finished talking about Aaron Nesmith, and we're going to talk about another wing, and that's Arizona's Josh Green. Josh Green is labeled as a 3 and D wing uh, by most draft guys. He's not a very versatile player. He's really limited to flashing and catch and shoot threes, but he is a really good defender. I'm impressed with his defense most of the time, Um, but he really needs to work on shooting more consistently and he has to become a better finisher at the rim. Derek, what do you think about Josh Green? Green is another one of those guys who gets the three and D label, but there's no three or offensive versatility to his game. Like he's just defense. Mm -hmm. Now he does that at an incredibly high level. He's one of my favorite defenders in the class. I think if he had any kind of offensive versatility, we would look at green in similar, maybe just shy of a Coro and Vassell type stature, just if the offense was there. Cause I think his defense is that good. Uh, Great hips, very, very fluid switchable. I think one through three, uh, at 6'6", six, six, I don't know if you're just going to get any switchability bigger than that, but he's so active on defense. Like, his feet are so fast. He, he stunts, tags, um, just provides some real value on that side. On offense, yeah, the shooting consistency is just a real issue. Um, just looking at his synergy numbers, 11th percentile off screens, um, 15th percentile as a pick-and-roll ball handler, and the finishing just really, the finishing just really wasn't very good. Now he was 85th percentile as a catch and shooter, mm-hmm. so that gives me hope. If that that is his only offensive role, I think he can grow into that. Um, but at this point, you know, 18 might be a little high for him. The intel also isn't great based mm-hmm. on people we've talked to at both the college and NBA level about him. So that is why he slips a little bit for us. Uh, I think 18 would be a reach, but. He's a guy that at 31, I would also be all over. Yeah, I mean, we talked a little bit earlier about the Mavericks philosophy, and I was talking about in the offseason, well, here's another philosophy. Do they want to try and improve their defense, or do they want to buy into this historic offense philosophy? Because that's where they could take a guy like Nesmith, who has ridiculous shooting numbers. Obviously, he's not going to shoot 52% from three in the NBA, but he's a really good shooter. And then they have a guy like Green, Who's going to be a headache? I haven't checked his synergy in a long time, but I'm pretty sure he was sh- shooting like 37% in the paint and was like 12th percentile around the rim, which is just ridiculous. Yeah, it's, 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 it's not good. <laughs> and I mean, this is again where the Mavericks are going to have to look at their timeline and say, okay, are we going to buy into green and have to work through these offensive struggles or are we going to try and go safer? Because this is actually kind of like 
like looking at his numbers kind of reminds me of Tim Hardaway Jr. Because Tim Hardaway Jr. isn't as bad of a finisher as this, but Tim Hardaway Jr. is not a great finisher at the rim. I mean, he misses some really easy layup at times. And I mean, the catch and shoot for Hardaway Jr. is his biggest threat. And there's a little bit of similarities there, except for the defensive end. I think Green is already a better defender than Hardaway Jr. Yeah, yeah, I think Green, that, that's the instant impact that he'll bring you is, is a lot of that on-ball defense. So the fourth guy on my big board, um, I affectionately refer to him as Poku, as does a lot of draft Twitter. Poku is the most intriguing draft prospect in this class to me because he is a freak of nature. He is seven foot tall or is he taller than that? Seven foot. Yep. Seven okay. Foot. So he's seven foot tall, but he is an insane playmaker. I mean, he looks like a guard when the ball's in his hands. He could run the offense. He's a pretty good shot for him. It hasn't translated into numbers yet, but he's got the, he's got a good shot for him. And I think that Maybe he has one of the higher ceilings in this draft. You listed LaMelo and Anthony Edwards as two of your guys who you see being all-stars. I think LaMelo is definitely up there with the highest ceiling. But I think that if all things go right for Poku, that he could be a very, very dangerous player in the NBA. But there are two huge, huge, huge things that need to pan out for him, and that's his weight and his shooting. Right now, he is skinny and he gets abused in the post it makes him a they list him they list him 200 pounds i highly doubt that yeah i mean that's that's crazy for him to be seven foot and 200 pounds i mean you can google him and he, you can tell he's a skinny dude and then the shooting because he's he's not going to be a force inside and so he's got to be able to have that shot on the outside and for me i know we might disagree but these are two two factors that like I think aren't the difference between him being good and bad but are like the difference between him being like at the top of your rotation and being out of the league mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what do you think about Poku yeah po Pokusevsky I think he's got a draft range of 5 to 30 <laughs> I think he can go literally anywhere like there's not a number where I say oh that was too high and then there's not a number where I say okay, I, I understand why teams aren't willing to take the risk on him. All right. You know, the intrigue is there. I mean, he is so versatile. He is. He's got the mind of a point guard at seven foot because the guard skills are what he's had his whole life. So he's an excellent passer for his size, moves really fluidly, uh, sees the floor well, passes with confidence. There's not a pass he doesn't think he can't make, and there's not a shot he doesn't think he can't hit. Um, shoots off of movement as well. And you just don't see that for seven footers. You know, you, you, the concerns are on the defensive end and with his body. He's an innate rim protector. Like he just, that's a part of him and his feel for the game, which is really, really strong. But I think if you put him on an NBA floor anytime soon, he's just getting bumped off of every line, probably a lot of foul trouble. And I just don't think it would look pretty. So he's a project in the sense that it's going to be a couple of years before he gives you legitimate NBA rotation minutes. But if it hits, if his body gets right, if an NBA team drafts him and gets the muscle on him that he needs, and he still has those guard skills, you have an absolute, absolute monster on your hands, a freak of nature. And he would be the guy that you look back in this class and everybody who took somebody before Poku, you would say they should have known to pick Poku. Like that, that's exactly who he is in this class if he hits. So I could see, I see him going in the lottery and I don't really have an issue with that. Uh, I know that there are a couple teams who have discussed him as an option in the twenties, uh, but I, I don't know if he gets there. So, but he's, he's just so intriguing. I just think teams, it'll be interesting to see who's willing to take a shot based on their timeline and who's willing to miss just in case he is a bust. So with, with the Mavericks kind of looking ahead into the future, their cap space isn't in a good place uh, for this offseason, assuming that Tim Hardaway Jr. opts in to his contract, which he likely will. Um, but after that, uh, if they decide to move on from Tim Hardaway Jr., their cap space is in a really good position until they extend Luka Doncic, or at least offer him the extension. Um, and I think that, like, right now, maybe I'm crazy, 
But looking down the road, I think that the Mavericks have a really good chance of being the biggest championship threat down the road. And that's because of their wealth of talent, uh, their age, their payroll, once Tim Hardaway Jr. opts out. And so if they have this stretch of road where they can develop and have some headaches over the next couple of years, maybe they take Poku here and they just assemble this team of European beasts that just dominates the league. Do you think that like, if the Mavericks are gonna buy into the timeline that Poku's a guy that they should go after? If they are confident that they can get one of the wings that they want at 31, like the other guys that come to mind for me, if they think that they can get a Bain, Stanley, Hughes, McDaniels, Woodard, if they think they can get one of those guys at 31, then I would have no issue at taking Poku because I think he's worth the swing. I mean, you put him in Porzingis. I mean, I'm trying to world a filled out Poku with NBA range and can pass Doncic and Porzingis together. I mean, literally as long as you have one lockdown defender on the floor, you can, you can be just about anybody you want. You're going to score so many points and be so fun to watch. That, yeah, if, if you think you can get one of the wings that you're confident in that will become a rotation player at 31, yeah, take a shot. I just – I would be wary of taking two shots. I would be worried about – I would be, you know, hesitate to take two reaches um, or, or maybe two high bust guys. Like, I wouldn't take Poku and then McDaniels down the road. Mm-hmm. Like, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But, yeah, if you're confident you can get one of those other guys, um, go ahead and take a shot at 18 because – Right now, we have him mocked to Brooklyn at 19 because they're in a spot where they can afford to miss. They don't need yeah. a guy to join the team right now. Uh, and I think, you know, Brooklyn at 19, I don't see why Denver at 22 wouldn't take him. They're just, they're just loading up on all the seven-footers. I mean, if you went MPJ, Bol Bol, Pokusevsky, and again, you don't have to have him be ready right away. So if you're going to take him, it would probably have to be 18. Yeah, you bring up a good point about 31. I didn't really think about that, that there, there will still be a, a few good wing options there, even if, you know, some of these guys that we've talked about before move up, they'll still have Nora and a couple of other guys there that they could take if they like. Mm-hmm. Like we have, we have Josh Green, Desmond Bain, and Jordan Nora all in the second round right now, mm. based on what we've been hearing from teams. So if, if, you, if you're comfortable with any of those three guys, then it makes sense to take a reach on somebody. Yeah, I think Poku Bain would be a pretty big win for a draft class. Especially that would be a great day. Especially considering your championship aspirations in the next couple of years. All right, the final guy that I've got on my five-man Mavericks big board is Precious Achua from Memphis. Um, not a lot to say about Achua right now because there are a lot of bigs on the Mavericks roster as is. And so I think that if they're going to draft a Chua, it should be if they shop Powell or if Willie Cauley-Stein opts out because he is a player option this year too, um, or if they want to shop Kleba, which is also an option. Uh, a Chua is a really, really good pick and roll threat. That's essentially his game. Um, so you can, you can see the fit with the Mavericks because the Mavericks are doing that with Dwight Powell. Um, but a Chua, he's just a freak athlete. He's a dog. He, he kind of plays – with the explosiveness as a guard, he's really quick. And I actually think he played guard for a little bit of his time in high school and middle school. Um, But yeah, he's bouncy. He's good in the pick and roll. And I can definitely see his fit on the Mavericks, assuming that they still don't have this many bigs on the roster. Yeah, you you nailed it there. It's just going to depend on who they bring back and who they want to move forward with. Because adding him in there with Kleba and Powell doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you do move one of those, Precious gives you that guy who can be an active small ball five rim runner, um, even in not small ball. Like you're seeing what Houston's doing right now. You put a chew on that team with the five, and I think it's a great fit. So if there's a lineup where, you know, Porzingis just wants to play outside, which he does, mm-hmm. uh, I think a Chua could work. But, you know, just like you're saying, it, Powell and Kleba, if you have both, which right now they're both under contract through the 2022 2023 season the end of the rookie deal would be 23 24 so it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense unless one of them is shopped before that 
Yeah, and the two is a guy I hear get, getting brought up a lot in draft talks amongst Mavericks fans, and I think that that's because he is such a good pick-and-roll player, and Mavericks fans are in love with pick-and-roll duos with Luka Doncic. <laughs> yep. um, and so I think that's why his name gets brought up so often, but I don't really see how he fits seamlessly into the five-out offense that Rick Carlisle like, likes to run because Atua is not a good shooter. No, I don't want him taking many shots for me at all. I want him catching lobs um, or c- catching on the move towards the basket as a cutter. Uh, that, that's, that's how I want him scoring. Other than that, I don't even really want him handling the ball much. So, yeah, I don't see much of an exterior presence for him. Yeah. Well, that was my Mavericks big board. Again, we've got Bain, Nesmith, Green, Poku, Achua. Those are just five names. There will be plenty of other names that I do some player profiles for over at MavsMoneyBall.com. Derek, thank you for joining me again today. Do you have anything else you want to say? Um, I I appreciate you having me on, Ryan. Again, always happy to talk draft. And I actually enjoy, you know, really some of these team-specific ones because that is how, when front offices look at it, diving team-specific, you have to take into account what's the timeline, what do our what does our contract situation look like? And I will just say to the Mavs fans listening, you're in a really good spot. Like it's a good time to be a Mavs fan. Obviously that Donkey, uh, that Doncic extension is coming. Mm-hmm. I would do it sooner rather than later, lock him up. No questions asked, like give him what he wants. Um, and then him and Porzingis, those contracts are going to be huge, but you've got two picks this year and, you know, I just, I just think it's a really good time to be a Mavs fan. So I think you're looking at a legitimate title contender within three to five years. And if you nail these picks, you're in good shape. So I appreciate you having me on. If you guys want to follow me on Twitter, it's D Murray NBA, and then follow Babcock Hoops and Matt Babcock as well. Um, we're always putting out, you know, the newest stuff we've got. We just interviewed a couple players, Lamar Stevens and Tyshawn Alexander, um, put out a Tyrell Terry scouting report a couple weeks ago, and I've got a new one coming out next week Um, and again we'll go to a couple workouts as well so be sure to follow us but again grateful for you thinking of me and having me on again this is ryan mainville from mavs moneyball and Derek murray from babcock hoops y'all stay well